Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 4, War and Waiting, Part 1. Harry slept like one dead, but he was awakened at dawn, and he rose yet heavy with sleep and somewhat stiff from the severe exertions of the day before. But it all came back in an instant, the army, the march, and the march yet to come. They had but a scanty breakfast, the wagons not yet having come up, and in a half hour they started again. They grumbled mightily at first, because the day was bleak beyond words, heavy with clouds and sharp with chill. The country seemed deserted, and certainly that somber air was charged with no omens of victory. But in spite of everything, the spirits of the young troops began to rise. They took a pride in this defiance of nature as well as man. They could endure cold and hunger and weariness as they would endure battle when it came. They went on thus three days, almost without food and shelter. Higher among the hills the snow sometimes beat upon them in a hurricane, and at night the winds howled as if they had come down fresh from the Arctic. The spirits of the young troops, after rising, fell again, and their feet dragged. Jackson, always watching, noticed it. Beckoning to several of his staff, including Harry, he rode back along the lines, giving a word of praise here and two words of rebuke there. They came at last to an entire brigade, halted by the roadside, some of the men leaning against an old rail fence. Jackson looked at the men and his face darkened. It was his own Stonewall Brigade, the one of which he was so proud, and which he had led in person into the war. Their commander was standing beside a tree, and riding up to him he demanded fiercely, "'What is the meaning of this?' Why have you stopped? I ordered a stop of a little while for the men to cook their rations, replied General Garnett. Jackson's face darkened yet further, and the blue eyes were menacing. There is no time for that, he said sharply. But the men can't go any farther without them. It's impossible. I never found anything impossible with this brigade. Jackson shot forth the words as if they were so many bullets, gave Garnett a scornful look, and rode on. Harry followed him as was his duty, but more slowly, and looked back. He saw a deep red flush show through Garnett's sunburn. But the preparations for cooking were stopped abruptly. Within three minutes the Stonewall Brigade was in line again, marching resolutely over the frozen road. Garnett had recognized that the impossible was possible, at least where Jackson led. Not many stragglers were found as they rode on toward the rear, but every regiment increased its speed at sight of the stern general. After circling around the rear, he rode back toward the front, and he left Harry and several others to go more slowly along the flanks and report to him later. When Harry was left alone, he was saluted with the usual good-humored chaff by the soldiers, who again demanded his horse of him, or asked him whether they were to fight or whether they were training to be foot racers. Harry merely smiled, and he came presently to the Invincibles, who were trudging along stubbornly, with the officers riding on their flanks. Langdon was as cheerful as usual. "'Things have to come to their worst before they get better,' he said to Harry, "'and I suppose we've about reached the worst. "'A sight of the enemy would be pleasant, even if it meant battle.' "'We're marching on Bath,' said Harry, "'and we ought to strike it tonight, "'though I'm afraid the Yankees have got warning of our coming.' "'He was thinking of Shepard, who now loomed very large to him. "'The circumstances of their meetings were always so singular "'that this northern scout and spy seemed to him to possess omniscience.' Beyond a doubt he would notify every northern garrison he could reach of Jackson's coming. Suddenly the band of South Carolinians who were still left in the Invincibles struck up a song. Ho, oh, woodsmen of the mountainside, ho, oh, dwellers in the vales, ho, oh, ye who by the chafing tide have roughened in the gales, leave barn and by, leave kin and cot, lay by the bloodless spade, let desk and case and counter rot and burn your books of trade. All the invincibles caught the swing and rush of the verses, and regiments before them and behind them caught the time, too, if not the words. The chant rolled in a great thundering chorus through the wintry forest. It was solemn and majestic, and it quickened the blood of these youths who believed in the cause for which they fought, just as those on the other side believed in theirs. It was written by one of our own South Carolinians, said St. Clair, with pride. Now here goes the second verse. Lead off there, Langdon. They'll all catch it. The desperate roves your fairest lands until he flies or fears. Your fields must grow but armed bands, your sheaves be sheaves of spears. Give up to mildew and to rust the useless tools of gain, 
and feed your country's sacred dust with floods of crimson rain. Louder and louder swelled the chorus of ten thousand marching men. It was not possible for the officers to have stopped them had they wished to do so, and they did not wish it. Stonewall Jackson, who had read and studied much, knew that the power of simple songs was scarcely less than that of rifle and bayonet, and he willingly let them sing on. Now and then a gleam came from the blue eyes in his tanned, bearded face. Harry, sensitive and prone to enthusiasm, was flushed in every vein by the marching song. He seemed to himself to be endowed with a new life of vigor and energy. The invader trod the southern land, and they must rush upon him at once. He was eager for a sight of the blue masses which they would certainly overcome. He returned to his place near the head of the column with the staff of the commander. Night was now close at hand, but Bath was still many miles away. It was colder than ever, but the wagons had not yet come up, and there were no rations in tents. Only a few scraps of food were left in the knapsacks. "'Ride to Captain Sherburn,' said General Jackson to Harry, "'and tell him to go forward with his men and reconnoiter. "'May I go with him, sir?' "'Yes, and then report to me what he and his men find.' Harry galloped gladly to the vanguard, where the gallant young captain and his troop were leading. These Virginians preserved their fine appearance. If they were weary, they did not show it. and They sat erect in their saddles, and the last button on their uniforms was in place. Their polished spurs gleamed in the wintry sun. They set off at a gallop, Harry riding by the side of Captain Sherburne. Blood again mounted high with the rapid motion and the sense of action. Soon they left the army behind, and, as the road was narrow and shrouded in forest, they could see nothing of it. Its disappearance was as complete as if it had been swallowed up in a wilderness. They rode straight toward Bath, but after two or three miles they slackened speed. Harry had told Sherburne of the presence of Shepard the night before, and the captain knew that they must be cautious. Another mile, and at a signal from the captain the whole troop stopped. They heard hoofbeats on the road ahead of them, and the sound was coming in their direction. A strong force, said Captain Sherburne. Probably larger than ours, if the hoofbeats mean anything, said Harry. And Yankees, of course. Here they are. A strong detachment of cavalry suddenly rounded a curve in the road and swept into full view. Then the horsemen stopped in astonishment at the sight of the Confederate troop. There was no possibility of either command mistaking the other for a friend, but Sherburne, despite his youth, had in him the instinct for quick perception and action which distinguished the great cavalry leaders of the South, like Jeb Stuart, Turner Ashby, and others. He drew his men back instantly somewhat in the shelter of the trees and received the Union fire first. As Sherburne had expected, few of the northern bullets struck home. Some knocked bark from the trees, others kicked up dirt from the frozen road, but most of them sang vainly through the empty air and passed far beyond. Now the southerners sent their fire full into the Union ranks, and at Sherburne's shouted command, charge with their leader at their head, swing his sword in glittering circles like some knight of old. The southern volley had brought down many horses and men, but the northern force was double in numbers, and many of the men carried new breech-loading rifles of the best make. While unused to horses and largely ignorant of the country, they had good officers and they stood firm. The southern charge, meeting a second volley from the breech-loading rifles, broke upon their front. Harry, almost by the side of Sherburne, felt the shock as they galloped into the battle smoke, and then he felt the Virginians reel. He heard around him the rapid crackle of rifles and pistols, sabers clashing together, the shouts of men, the terrible neighing of wounded horses, and then the two forces drew apart, leaving a sprinkling of dead and wounded between. It was a half-retreat by either, the two drawing back sixty or seventy yards apiece and then beginning a scattered and irregular fire from the rifles. But Sherburne, alert always, soon drew his men into the shelter of the woods and attempted an attack on his enemy's flank. Some destruction was created in the Union ranks by the fire from the cover of the forest, but the officers of the opposing force showed skill, too. Harry had no doubt from the way the northern troops were handled that at least two or three West Pointers were there. They quickly fell back into the forest on the other side of the road and sent return volleys. Harry heard the whistle and whiz of bullets all about him. Bark was clipped from trees and dry twigs fell, yet little damage was done by either. The forest, though leafless, was dense, and trunks and low boughs afforded much shelter. Both ceased fire presently, seeming to realize at the same moment that nothing was being done, and hovered among the trees, each watching for what the other would try next. Harry kept close to Captain Sherburne, whose face plainly showed signs of deep disgust. His heart was full of battle, and he wished to get at the enemy. But prudence forbade another charge upon a force double his numbers and now sheltered by a wood. 
At this moment it was the boy beside him who was cooler than he. Captain Sherburn, he suggested mildly, didn't General Jackson merely want to find out what was ahead of him? When the army comes up, it will sweep this force out of its way. That's so, agreed Sherburn reluctantly, but if we retire, they'll claim a victory, and our men will be depressed by the suspicion of defeat. But the Yankees are retiring already. Look, you can see them withdrawing. They were on the same business that we were, and it's far more important for them to be sure that Jackson is advancing than it is for us to know that an enemy's in front. You're right. We knew already that he was there, and we were watching to get him. It's foolish for us to stay here, squabbling with a lot of obstinate Yankees. We'll go back to Jackson as fast as we can. You're a bright boy, Harry. He dropped a hand affectionately on Harry's shoulder, then gave the order to the men, and they turned their horses' heads toward the army. At the same time, they saw with their own eyes the complete withdrawal of the Union troops, and the proud Virginians were satisfied. It was no defeat. It was merely a parting by mutual consent, each moving at the same instant. That is, if the Yankees didn't go first. They galloped back over the frozen road, and Captain Sherburne admitted once more to himself the truth of Harry's suggestion. Already the twilight was coming, and again it was heavy with clouds. In the east, all the peaks and ridges were wrapped about with them, and the captain knew that they meant more snow. Heavy snow was the worst of all things for the advance of Jackson. Captain Sherburne gave another signal to his men, and they galloped faster. The hoofbeats of nearly two hundred horses rang hard on the frozen road, but with increased speed, pulses throbbed faster and spirits rose. The average age of the troops was not over twenty, and youth thought much of action, little of consequences. They saw in a half hour the heads of columns toiling up the slopes, and then Jackson riding on Little Sorrel, his shoulders bent forward slightly, the grave eyes showing that the great mind behind them was still at work, planning, planning, always planning. Their expression did not change when Sherburne, halting his horse before him, saluted respectfully. "'What did you find, Captain Sherburne?' he asked. "'The enemy, sir. We ran into a force of cavalry about four hundred strong. "'And then?' We had a smart little skirmish with them, sir, and then both sides withdrew. Undoubtedly they went to report to their people, as you have come to report to yours. It looks as if our attempt to surprise Bath might fail, but we'll try to reach it tonight. Lieutenant Kenton, ride back and give the brigade commanders orders to hasten their march. He detached several others of his staff for the same duty, and in most cases wrote brief notes for them. Harry noticed how he took it for granted that one was always willing to do work, and yet more work. He himself had just ridden back from battle, and yet he was sent immediately on another errand. He noticed, too, how it set a new standard for everybody. This way Jackson had of expecting much was rapidly causing his men to offer much as a matter of course. While Jackson was writing the notes to the brigadiers, he looked up once or twice at the darkening skies. The great mass of clouds, charged with snow that had been hovering in the east, was now directly overhead. When he had finished the last note, it was too dark for him to write any more without help of torch. As he handed the note to the aide who was to take it, a great flake of snow fell upon his hand. Harry found that the brigades could move no faster. They were already toiling hard. The twilight had turned to night, and the clouds covered the whole circle of the heavens. The snow, slow at first, was soon falling fast. The soldiers brushed it off for a while, and then, feeling that it was no use, let it stay. Ten thousand men, white as if wrapped in winding sheets, marched through the mountains. Now and then a thin trickle of red from a foot, encased in a shoe worn through, stained the snow. The wind was not blowing, and the night, reinforced by the clouds, became very dark, save the gleam from the white covering of snow upon the earth. Torches began to flare along the line, and still Jackson marched. Harry knew what was in his mind. He wished to reach Bath that night and fall upon the enemy when he was not expected, even though that enemy had been told that Jackson was coming. The commander in front, whoever he might be, certainly would expect no attack in the middle of the night and in a driving snowstorm. But the fierce spirit of Jackson was forced to yield at last. His men, already the best marchers on the American continent, could go no farther. The order was given to camp. Harry more than guessed how bitter was the disappointment of his commander, and he shared it. The men, half-starved and often stiff with cold, sank down by the roadside. They no longer asked for the wagons containing their food and heavy clothing, because they no longer expected them. They passed from high spirits to a heavy apathy, and now they did not seem to care what happened. But the officers roused them up as much as possible, made them build fires with every piece of wood they could find, and then let them wrap themselves in their blankets and go to sleep, save for the sentinels. 
All night long the snow beat on Jackson's army lying there among the mountains, and save for a few Union officers not far away, both north and south wondered what had become of it. It was known at Washington and Richmond that Jackson had left Winchester, and then he had dropped into the dark. The eyes of the leaders at both capitals were fixed upon the greater armies of McClellan and Johnston, and Stonewall Jackson was not yet fully understood by either. Nevertheless, the gaunt and haggard President of the North began to feel anxiety about this Confederate leader who had disappeared with his army in the mountains of northern Virginia. The telegraph wires were not numerous then, but they were kept busy answering the question about Jackson. Banks and the other Union leaders in the valley sent reassuring replies. Jackson would not dare to attack them. They had nearly three times as many men as he, and it did not matter what had become of him. If he chose to come, the sooner he came, the sooner he would be annihilated. McClellan himself laughed at the fears about Jackson. He was preparing his own great army for a march on Richmond, one that would settle everything. But the army of Jackson nevertheless rose from the snow the next morning and marched straight on the Union garrison. The rising was made near Bath, and the army literally brushed the snow from itself before eating the half of a breakfast and taking to the road again, Jackson on Little Sorrel leading them. Harry, as usual, rode near him. Harry, despite exertions and hardships which would have overpowered him six months before, did not feel particularly hungry or weary that morning. No one in the army had caught more quickly than he the spirit of Stonewall Jackson. He could endure anything, and in another hour or two they would pass out of this wilderness of forest and snow and attack the enemy. Bath was just ahead. A thrill passed through the whole army. Everybody knew that Jackson was about to attack. While the first and reluctant sun of dawn was trying to pierce the heavy clouds, the regiments, spreading out to right and left to enclose Bath, began to march. Then the sun gave up its feeble attempts, the clouds closed in entirely, the wind began to blow hard, and with it came a blinding snow, and then a bitter hail. Harry had been sent by Jackson to the right flank with orders, and he was to remain there, unless it became necessary to inform the commander that some regiment was not doing its duty. But he found them all marching forward, and, falling in with the Invincibles, he marched with them. Yet it was impossible for the lines to retain cohesion or regularity, so fierce was the beat of the storm. It was an alternation of blinding snow and of hail that fairly stung. Often the officers could not see the men thirty yards distant, and there was no way of knowing whether the army was marching forward in the complete half-circle as planned. Regiments might draw apart, leaving wide gaps between, and no one would know it in all that hurricane. Harry rode by the side of Colonel Leonidas Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire, who were leading the Invincibles in person. Both had gray military cloaks drawn around them, but Harry saw that they were shivering with cold as they sat on their horses, with the snow accumulating on their shoulders and on the saddles around them. In truth, the foot cavalry had rather the better of it, as the hard marching kept up the circulation. "'Not much like the roses of Charleston,' said Colonel Talbot, faintly smiling." "'But I am glad to be here,' said Harry, "'although I will admit it, sir, "'that I did not expect a campaign to the North Pole. "'Neither did I, but I am prepared for anything now "'under the commander that we have. "'Bear in mind, my young friend, "'that this is for your private ear only. "'Of course, sir. "'What was that? "'Wasn't it a rifle shot? "'The report is faint, but it was certainly made by a rifle. "'And hark, there are others. "'We've evidently come upon their outposts. "'Confound this storm!' It keeps us from seeing more than twenty yards in front of us. The scattered rifle fire continued, and the weary soldiers raised their heads, which they had bent to shelter their eyes from the driving snow and hail. Pulses leapt up again, and blood sparkled. The whole army rushed forward. The roofs of houses came into view, and there was Bath. But the firing had been merely that of a small rear guard, skirmishers who surrendered promptly. The garrison, warned doubtless by Shepard, and then the scouting troop had escaped across the river, but Jackson's wintry march was not wholly in vain. The fleeing Union troops had no time either to carry away or destroy the great stores of supplies accumulated there for the winter, and the starving and freezing Southerners plunged at once into the midst of plenty, ample compensation to the young privates. The population, ardently Southern, as everywhere in these Virginia towns, welcomed the army with wild enthusiasm. Officers and soldiers were taken into the houses, as many as Bath could hold, and enormous fires were built in the open spaces for the others. They also showed the way at once to the magazines, where the Union supplies were heaped up. Harry, at the direction of his general, went with one of the detachments to seize these. Their first prize was an old but large storehouse, crammed full of the things they needed most. The tall mountain youth, Seth Moore, was one of his men, and he proved to be a prince of looters. 
Blankets, blankets, cried Moore. Here they are, hundreds of them. And look at these barrels, bacon, beef, crackers. And look at the piles of cheese. Oh, Lieutenant Kenton, how my mouth waters. Can't I bite into one of them cheeses? Not yet, said Harry, whose own mouth was watering too. But you can, Seth, within ten minutes at the farthest. The whole army must bite at once. That's foreign squire, but ain't this richness. Cove oysters, cans and cans of them, and how I love them. And sardines, too, lots of them. Why, well, I could bite right through the tin boxes to get at them. And rice and hominy and bags of flour, while the North has been sending whole train loads of things down here for us to eat. And she's been sending more than that, said Harry. Here are five or six hundred fine breech-loading rifles, and hundreds of thousands of cartridges. She's been sending us arms and ammunition with which to fight her. His boyish spirit burst forth. Even though an officer, he could not control them, and he was radiant as the looting Seth Moore himself. He went out to report the find and to take measures concerning it. On his way, he met hundreds of the southern youths who had already been put on heavy blue overcoats found in the captured stores. The great revulsion had come. They were laughing and cheering and shaking the hands of one another. It was a huge picnic, all the more glorious because they had burst suddenly out of the storm in the icy wilderness. But order was soon restored, and wrapped in warm clothing they feasted like civilized men, the great fires lighting up the whole town with a cheerful glow. Harry was summoned to new duties. He was also a new man. Warmth and food had doubled his vitality, and he was ready for any errand on which Jackson might send him. While it was yet snowing, he rode with a half-dozen troopers toward the Potomac. On the other side was a small town which also held a Union garrison. Scouting warily along the shores, Harry discovered that the garrison was still there. Evidently the enemy believed in the protection of the river, or many of their leaders could not yet wholly believe that Jackson and his army, making a forced march in the dead of winter, were at hand. But he had no doubt that his general would attend to these obstinate men, and he rode back to Bath with the news. Jackson gave his worn troops a little more rest. They were permitted to spend all that day and night at Bath, luxuriating and renewing their strength and spirits. Harry slept, for the first time in many nights, in a house, and he made the most of it, because he doubted whether he would have another such chance soon. Dawn found the army up and ready to march away from this place of delight. They went up and down the Potomac three or four days, scattering or capturing small garrisons, taking fresh supplies and spreading consternation among the Union forces in northern Virginia and Maryland. It was all done in the most bitter winter weather and amid storms of snow and hail. The roads were slippery with sleet, and often the cavalry were compelled to dismount and lead their horses long distances. There was little fighting because the northern army was always in numbers too small to resist, but there was a great deal of hard riding and many captures. End of chapter 4, part 1